So I'm wrapping things up the other day. There's stuff that I've experimented with that I haven't told anyone about. I did a thing recently where I know how to build websites. What if I did a pop-up website, a site that only existed for like three days, I think it was. When I say that, do you think that's a good idea? I thought it was a great idea. But then I realized like I'm asking people to go somewhere where they have no idea who the people are, asking them to buy things on the internet. Because there was lots of visits. That gave me the ability to go, well, I still think it's a good idea. How can I rethink this? So then if I put it under the umbrella of the site that I already have, maybe it would work better. Like do you, if I did a thing where I'm like, I sold a limited amount of things by other artists or things that I do, and it was only available for a few days, and they were like special things that were never going to be made again. I mean, would you visit it? I don't know. I still think it's a good idea. Might be, might not. I don't know. That's one of the things I've tried. Actually, I've been trying out a new song this entire season. If you actually go back to the first episode of the season and just kind of skip all the way through from show to show, I've been working on a song and it's kind of evolved over time to what you're hearing in the background of this episode right now. So I've been using this podcast to test out what I think of a song. J just lots of stuff in the background, like it's all under different names. I've been trying different ways to bring traffic to my site. That's why I like to do, first of all, this whole podcast is about meeting people and trying new things. Before I did this podcast, I didn't do anything. I had all these ideas. I had all this, like, I'm going to try this thing someday. And now I am trying those things and I'm trying them whenever I get the chance. That's why I do this show in seasons. So I take a break, go try some things out and then start new. And that's why I'm wondering if when this season is over, I'm thinking maybe I'm going to start a online course or start a YouTube channel or do live videos that just show like where I started, how I, how I created each thing along the way. I don't know, maybe just kind of do a behind the scenes sort of look. So. If you're interested in that, I guess the best way to follow along is to either go to my YouTube channel or sign up for the email list and I'll tell you where all these things are going to be at AmericanBandito.com slash email. I'll try that. I'm Tom Ray and this is American Bandito. The person that I meet today actually is someone that I've been following for quite some time and I really like her drawing style. Hi, I'm Emily Balsley and I am an illustrator living in Madison. We'd been messaging back and forth and I've been trying to get her on the show. Then I saw recently that she was doing a mural here at the university. She's done all kinds of illustration and work for magazines and for companies and she even just got represented by an agency recently. One thing that I love is that she actually does artwork full time and we talk a little bit about that. Have you always been here, or where are you from? I was born in Green Bay. I lived there for two years, and then I uh, moved to Marathon, which is up near Wausau. And I went to school in Madison. I finished up my degree, my art degree, here at UW-Madison, and I've been living here ever since. How did that all start, like, the actually going to school for it? Well, I took as many art classes as I could in high school, but there, like, weren't a lot offered, and they were pretty general. But I had a great art teacher in high school. His name was Mr. Christensen. We called him Mr. C for short. And he was super supportive of me and my art. And he submitted my work to different awards and for scholarships and stuff like that. So I actually won a few art awards in high school, thanks to Mr. C. Um, so super supportive. In fact, one of my high school uh, life drawing paintings, or life paintings, I should say, won an award that sent it to the U.S. Capitol for a year. So in 1993, I believe, my painting was hanging in Congressman Dave Obie's office for a year. And I went to visit it with my family, which was cool. So um, it was like a sneaker, uh, an apple was in it. You know, it was just like a little collection of objects that Mr. C put in the middle of the room for all. I think we were practicing like shading and highlights. So it was a painting and so we were working on, you know, the reflections in the the shading and stuff like that. I was really specifically proud of the apple. Oh, you were? Okay. <laughs> well, and so the style, like, it was it was realistic, but I know, or it sounds like you're saying it was realistic, but your style right now is not technically that way. It's a lot more uh, illustrative. So how did you transition, or how did you find that kind of voice? Yeah, you're right. Um, the, the high school painting was much more realistic, but that was, I mean, what we were supposed to be working on. We were supposed to be rendering from life, and... So my current style, which, like you said, is much more illustrative, much more stylized, 
graphic, bold, flat colors. That has kind of evolved over the last few years. Why just in the past few years did you start going in that direction? Because I've only been illustrating for a few years, and so when I started focusing on illustration, I was kind of looking at a lot of art and a lot of other illustration, and I was really inspired and influenced by mid-century illustration. Um, so like Mary Blair, um, Devoisin, um, some, so some of these artists that were working with kind of flat colors with some line work integrated into it, but more just the flats. And I just love that, that style. And so I think when I kind of rediscovered drawing and illustration, I was heavily influenced by that. So I was drawing in that way, but then slowly kind of evolved into what my current style is, just these kind of eyes and these kinds of noses, you know, like those little characteristics that make it my style and make it recognizable as my style. That happened in the last, I would say, three years or so. Was there a project or something that led you up to it, or you just were like, I need a change? <laughs> well, I love drawing people and animals, and so I was actually doing some family portraits for a while, some illustrated family portraits, and I think just by drawing people over and over again, and different people, you know, different hairstyles, different you know, facial hair, or glasses, you know, all those different things. Just drawing enough of it, it just evolved from, from there. So now I don't really have to think about it. I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna draw a face. This is, here it is, and I can just whip it out really fast without much thought. You also do a lot of books. So how did you get into making those type of things? Specifically, you just did the Spark one. That was, That's relatively new, right? Yes, yep. That uh, Spark just got published the end of last summer, so August of 2018. That was with American Girl. That's my first fully illustrated book. Um, I had done some other book work, which was more like spot illustrations or book covers or jackets, but Spark was my first fully illustrated book. Um, and that one came about, I've been doing work with American Girl for a few years, but it was all on the magazine side. And so they would hire me for one feature and then I would do a few spot illustrations. But when this book came along, the author, Andrea, I had worked with her in the past on the magazine side, but this is her first, her first book that she had written. And it's all about creativity, about um, creativity for kids specifically and what that means because it's different for every person and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're good at drawing. It could mean that you like to play an instrument or you like to cook or you like to problem solve. So creativity can mean so many things. And when she came up with this concept, she immediately thought of me as the illustrator because we had worked together in the past and she was familiar with my style and she just thought that it would be perfect for what she was envisioning for the book. And so she kind of told me about the idea and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I love the idea of it. I mean, the, the concept of the book was right up my alley. In fact, I, could, I even helped her concept a little bit and brainstorm some of the activities and little parts of the book. I mean, she still definitely wrote all of it, but she could bounce some of the ideas off of me just being a creative person myself. So it was a really perfect project for my first book. So you said that you'd worked with American Girl in the past. So how did you get involved with them to begin with? Oh, that was friend of a friend kind of thing. So one of my friends that I just hang out with, we do like craft nights and stuff together. Her husband was one of the art directors at, at uh, American Girl. So he's the one that hired me initially. And then I eventually worked with some other art directors as well. So the book, now the process of making that, you said she thought you'd be, first of all, so she just one day goes, I'm going to make this idea for a book. Like it, That whole process, like when you're doing that, is it like, okay, I'm getting paid for this, you're getting paid after it, do you get royalties? Like, how does that all work? So I don't get royalties. They just essentially pay me a flat okay. fee, essentially. So they own the illustrations. I just hand them over, and mm -hmm. they're theirs to use whatever they want and do whatever they want with it. But as far as her book concept came up with, I think because she had worked at the, the magazine previously, yeah. she sees all of the letters that the girls write into the magazine. And there were enough of these letters that were wanting to see more um, from a creative standpoint yeah. for girls of that age, which is like the eight to 12 year range. She's like, huh, maybe there's something to be said for this. Because there are a lot of books about creativity, but they're usually geared for adults. And there are even a few that are picture books, but nothing in that like middle range. And so I think she saw there was a void. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the book kind of came about from the letters that, that these girls had been writing into the magazine. Mm -hmm. 
how do you maintain and manage all this? And now you're also working on a mural here, so how, how do you do it all? <laughs> I'll be honest, it is definitely the hardest part of my job, just because I am working with several clients, several projects at one time, and I want each of my clients to feel like I'm really only working on their project, right? I'm not neglecting anyone. So that means that there's a lot of balls in the air at one point. And for me, and plus, you know, all of these different, different projects have different timelines, different deadlines, you know, just managing expectations and all of that too. So it is really challenging. And for me, it's just a getting out an idea of what my big picture is and then like my day to day. So I actually have a calendar. It's a desk calendar, you know, like those big sheets, right? Uh, essentially a blank one. So I can just write in the month and write in all the dates essentially. So I use three of those at a time and I hang them on my wall. So I have the current month and then the next two months. But because it's a, a desk calendar, each of the days is a, a big square, you know, like a two inch by two inch square essentially. And so I use post-it notes and like color coded post-it notes. And so like on my, I'm calling it my wall calendar, it's just three months at a time. Yeah. I use colored post-it notes. I put like hot pink is my hard deadline. So I'll throw those all up there first. And then yellow are like Stella days. My, Stella is my daughter. And so, you know, whether she has days off cause those I can't really count as work days cause I'm, you know, responsible for Stella. And then I'll pencil things in. I never use pen just because things change, right? And then, Purple is sketches, you know, so I have different color coding and then I have a like a um, planner essentially, which is a weekly planner and that way I can see like my specific week and it's all detailed out that way. Hmm. So that just really helps me with like kind of the, the daily and the big picture because when I wasn't doing that, that three month calendar, I was all over the place. People would ask me for something. I'm like, ah, I have no idea. And okay. it was... I don't know, I just, it was very, a very unsettling feeling. So since I've been doing this three-month calendar thing, I feel like I have a better grasp on everything at one time, if that makes sense. It does. And also, did you do this physical calendar? Like, why wouldn't you have done it digitally? Or did you do it digitally? And that's where you had problems. It's funny, because, like, don't get me wrong. I, ha I love my technology. I have, you know, a new iPhone and all of that. But I never use the calendar function on it. I just, because I feel like... I don't know. I just, I like the visual, first of all. Like, I, and being able to pencil something, like, literally pencil something in and, or erase something. Like, I don't know. It, I think it just sticks in my brain better if I, like, physically write it in. I don't know. I just, maybe I'm just slow to adopt that technology. But for me right now, it's just, like, my, my little planner and then my big calendar, my three-month calendar. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems to work. try to make sure that you also just do personal stuff that entertains you or inspires you. Where do you get the ideas for those? That is really important to me, the personal work, because I don't want to lose myself. Plus, that's always a way for me to experiment with different mediums or maybe something that, like, you know, an itch that needs to be scratched, like something I've been thinking about and this is my, my chance to work on it. So a lot of times those daily challenges or those 100-day projects are where I get to kind of play around with my art a little bit. So, for example, that my 2018 100-day project was 100 days of I love you. And that was essentially me hand-lettering I love you in 100 different languages, which in and of itself is a good challenge, right? Because I have to come up with 100 different lettering styles and typefaces, and that was tricky. But the challenge, the greater challenge for that for me was I made myself use procreate the the app on my my ipad okay. so i had gotten an ipad with the intention of learning how to use procreate but every time i sat down to actually use it i got so flustered that i'm like Ugh, i'm just gonna go and use photoshop because that's what i know and that's what i'm comfortable with but for this 100 day project I'm like okay this is perfect like this is gonna force me to actually sit down and learn the app and learn how to use it and so i did a, a skillshare class and quickly learn the basics of Procreate just enough that I could actually get through this project. And it was good. Like, it did force me to learn it, and now I feel a lot more comfortable when I do decide to do some work in that in that app. So, yeah, there's always, a like, another layer of challenge in those daily projects for me. So, and I like the daily projects because there's accountability. Um, from, like, a social media standpoint, it's a good way for me to get more followers is because if we're all doing 
because a lot of people, for example, the, the 100 day project, a lot of people participate in that. And so that's a good way to get to know people and network and get a few more followers. And plus then it's accountability because people are following you and are watching you and are expecting you to post every day. So kind of keeps tabs on me as well. The one thing I've learned from using tablets and phones and stuff like that is it's just, it, it's so slippery. <laughs> it's slippery, that darn pen. Just, it is. Yeah. Most of the living that you make, is it from client work or is there freelance stuff? I would say the majority of my income is client work. I, I consider that my freelance too. That's kind of one and the same for me. But I have been doing a few like shows, markets every year where I sell my products. So prints and greeting cards. So the two shows I do pretty consistently every year are Dane Handmade and The Good Day Market. I don't want to focus too much of my time on those shows. So that's why I try to just limit it to a few every year. But it's a good way for me to get myself out into the community and meet some of the people that might follow me on Instagram or just just getting the opportunity to explain my work and my thought process and um, it's, I think it's good for me because most of the time I'm working by myself and I don't really get out and about very often so it's nice to go and you know talk to people and talk about my art and make it sound like you're just in, in complete solitude <laughs> I mean yeah kind of I'm working by myself I mean my dog and my cat are there but they don't say much generally so <laughs> do you ever dabble in advertising or anything like that I haven't ever done any advertising for me it's purely social media I have have the Instagram account and then I also have a, a Facebook account specifically for my illustration which is essentially the same thing because when I post on Instagram I just click the Facebook button and it posts the same thing on Facebook but it's for those people that don't have Instagram but yeah I, I found I, I actually really love social media because it's such a great way to connect and find like-minded people and I just feel so thankful that we have it as an option because even 10 years ago, there wasn't this mm -hmm. such thing as social media, right? So it's essentially free advertising and mm -hmm. it's not always a good thing because it, I feel like I also spend a lot of my time on it and just like scrolling through my feed, which is good, but it's also like, oh, I should really be actually making something and get off the screen. Well, you know, they got that thing built into Instagram now where you can look and see how much time you've spent on it. I know, and it's very scary, <laughs> but I tell myself, <laughs> social media equals work, right? <laughs> I, for me, I think it does. I I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to justify it, but... What kind of interesting connections have you made on there? Well, I mean, I made a lot of connections. I found a lot of just fellow creatives in the Madison area through Instagram, just people tagging their friends and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. I'm always clicking on links and hashtags and stuff like that and so I feel like I found so many great people just in this area alone just through Instagram and I'm I participate in you know a few like Facebook groups and stuff like that and so that's a good way to connect with people around the world as well I did a couple online classes and those Facebook groups were really good for that because all the people that were in the class with me were in the Facebook group and so it was a good way to discuss the assignments or other things that we might be going through at the same time but again being like-minded people, whether they're illustrators or whatnot, it was nice to kind of have that community of people that were doing the same thing or maybe at the same point of our career. And so we could kind of bounce things off of each other or, or we're having similar, you know, like, oh, it's tax season and we can all complain about doing our taxes <laughs> or whatever it is, right? Like, it's nice having that tribe of people. Yeah. And so I, for me, those Facebook, group, Facebook groups were good for that. Do you work out of your home or do you have a studio? I work out of my home. The third bedroom of our house is my studio and it's also the sunniest room in our house because it's the only room that has windows on two walls, which is awesome. So it's super bright and I have it decorated with all of my friends' artwork and so I just love being in the space. But yeah, that's where I have my computer and my scanner and my printer and um, all my painting supplies and stuff like that. Um, I also have a little sofa in there and another desk with another computer so my whole family can be in there when I'm working because I don't really want to just segregate myself necessarily. So that way, you know, my husband can lay on the couch and read and my daughter can be, you know, 
playing on the computer and whatnot, but we can all be in one room, so it's kind of a nice multi-purpose space. Actually, when you were naming the equipment that you said before, I thought about how you had mentioned uh, sometimes you made prints and greeting cards. Do you print a lot of those out yourself, or do you have them done somewhere? Like, where do you have that done at? I do not print them. I used to, but I found that I'm just too cheap to invest in. <laughs> That's actually why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. My standards are way higher than they used to be, to be honest. So I outsource all of my printing now. So greeting cards, I get printed at moo.com. Yeah, which is where I got all of my business cards. But now I've been using them for greeting cards, too. And they're nice because they do the, they call it printfinity, where you can submit like up to 20 or 25 different designs, which is nice. So I can do a batch of cards that all have different fronts, which is really cool. And then the same back. I can just put my logo on the back and be done with it. So that's really nice. And then I get my Gicle prints printed. Is that how you say that? Gicle. Okay. <laughs> it's French. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have two sources. I use either uh, Picture Salon, which is local, and I, I prefer to use them just because I would prefer to support local. But they're slightly more expensive than other options. And so if I have a lot of printing that I need to do, I'll use gclaytoday.com, which is good. Slightly less expensive than Picture Salon, but the quality is just as good. I heard about it a while back, and it's like, oh, it's really just like inkjet printing. Naming it that is just a way to kind of legitimize it. Exactly. So fancy. <laughs> Biggest challenge for me is definitely kind of the administrative side of my business. Being a freelancer, you get to see all of the fun stuff that I do, like all of the art and all of that, which is glamorous and all, but there's also the other side of it, which is the, the invoicing and the emails and all of that. And that side of it really bogs me down to the point where I feel like I'm actually spending more time emailing these days than I am actually making art. And so that's very frustrating for me. And that's one of the reasons that I now have an agent because I kind of came to the point where I felt like I was spending so much time on that administrative stuff that it just, it was just too much. The agent contacted me and I'm like, oh, maybe this is the answer because they will take care of a lot of that stuff, like the negotiating and the invoicing and some of the emailing, you know, when new projects come or new clients come in. So again, I'm not that far into the whole agency thing to know if it's going to make much of a difference. but. Right now I'm hoping that it will take a little bit of that burden off of me so I have more time to make art, but I would definitely say that administrative part, you know, like now it's coming on up to tax season and so now I gotta balance my books and make sure all of my invoices are square. You know, it's just all of that. Like I can do it, but it's really stressful for me and I would much rather be drawing than doing accounting, but it has to be done. First of all, I like how you're like, they contacted you. So seriously, even the agent contacted you? Twice. The first time I turned them down. <laughs> because I think it was a pride thing, to be honest. Like, no, I'm getting these great clients on my own. Why would I pay someone else to find me clients when I can do it myself? And then a year and a half later, they contacted me again. I'm like, so, are you still interested? And I'm like, well, okay, maybe let's talk this time, so. On top of that, I have, I would have a hard time letting go. Like, how do you let go of not being in control of that stuff? Like, is that, well, I guess you said you haven't done it that much yet, but I guess leading up to it, are you okay with that? Or are there ways you're dealing with that? Like, that would be my biggest problem. I'll be honest, I am kind of freaking out about that because I am totally a control freak to the point where I want to be writing the emails myself because for me, my business is based on me and my relationships and my personality. And if someone else is writing my emails, unless they're like a perfect match to who I am and what I re represent, I don't want someone else writing those emails and creating those relationships. So yes, that's a good question. Like I do feel like I would have, ha have a hard time releasing some of that but at the same time I know that something has to give and if that means sacrificing some emails to someone else okay we'll see how it goes I'm willing to try it at least and that's the thing with this agency is it's a it's a six month trial period even though we're pretty close to six months at this point but if I don't like it if it doesn't make me comfortable I can stop at any point but I do want to try it and see how it goes because I am curious to see how it changes Right now, I'm 
working on probably one of my more exciting projects of my career. And it's a mural that's at the Memorial Union at, on the UW campus. And um, it's really exciting for me just in multiple ways. First of all, I'm a UW alum, so just the fact that I'm doing a mural at the Memorial Union, which is such an iconic place, is so crazy to think. Like, if you would have asked me as, like, little Bachelor of Fine Arts major Emily, like, hey, someday you're going to paint a mural at the Union, and they're like, no way. So it's pretty cool in that regard. But then, you know, on another degree, I've been really wanting to do mural work and just kind of see my art at a bigger scale and in different environments and stuff like that. And so I feel like this is going to be a really good opportunity to put that kind of work out there and hopefully generate some more of this type of work. And plus, it's just been really fun to get out of the house and get out into the community and, and just work in a different space and be with people. And it's just been a really fun project and being able to work so big. Is this the biggest project you've done, like scale-wise? Yeah, I think so. I've done a couple other murals, but this one is by far the biggest. I mean, it's 25 feet long by 11 and a half feet wide or high I should say so it's it's a it's a big space and just seeing my characters blowing up to three or four feet mm. it's so crazy but really fun what are some of the other murals you've done I have done a mural at the bowl of heaven at Hilldale mall so that one was about three years ago and the other one was at the fit on Monroe Street it's a little fitness place and that one was all typography based, so it's just a bunch of words in the like the main wall when you walk in. Both really fun, but I haven't done it in a few years. How do you scale it when you put it on the wall? Well, I do it really small. They gave me the dimensions initially, and so I had like a blank template that had the shape of the wall with all the dimensions, and so I did the actual sketch on that template, and then I just blew it up on my computer to the right dimensions. Um, I divided it up into three foot wide sections because at FedEx Kinko's they have a three foot wide printer okay. and so I could actually print out the design at like to scale and it ended up being what eight plus sheets of paper essentially because it's a 25 foot wide mural. Yeah, I tacked it up onto the wall. I got some transfer paper and transferred the design onto the wall. and. Yeah started painting and the rest is history. I guess I guess one other thing that's kind of exciting for me is uh, last summer I did my first Camp Blue Star, which is a little art camp for kids. I called it a maker camp. I mean, it's essentially art, but I called it maker just because it was kind of, we were doing a lot of different skills. So th these kids were doing things like sewing and printmaking and um, fabric dyeing and let's see, painting weaving, so we were touching on a lot of different skills, and um, for me, I wanted to do projects that were more tangible and um, more, I guess, practical in a way, so things that these kids could actually use in their life, and so this particular camp was for kids ages 8 to 12, I believe, and so they made things like a rug made out of old t-shirts or um, they made little pinch pots, but then they made the little felt succulents to go in it. And then they also made a macrame hanger so they could hang it up in their window. You know, so things like that, not necessarily like throwaway art. You know, it's not just a drawing or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with just a drawing, <laughs> but you know, something a little bit more tangible that they, would, they could use in their everyday life. And I was trying my best to incorporate maybe materials that they already have around their house or you know, like the old t-shirts for example like we all have old t-shirts laying around and so you can make that into yarn believe it or not just by tearing it and cutting it into strips and then you can make a rug out of that and so just kind of instilling in these kids that if there is something that you want maybe you can make it yourself without asking your mom and dad to let's go to Target and get it or whatnot like maybe you can just use what you have laying around the house and make it yourself. So that was a really fun experiment. The, the camp was actually at our house, which was okay. brought another interesting level to it because, you know, it kind of turned our house upside down. But it worked, and it was a really fun kind of non-traditional space. I wanted these kids to feel like they could just make themselves at home, and which they did. Some of these kids chose to work in our backyard or sit on the couch mm -hmm. or sit on the steps, like whatever made them comfortable. I wanted them to feel like they could work in whatever space 
felt the best for them. So it was just an afternoon camp too, so four hours a day. And so you didn't have to like house them and all that kind of stuff. Correct, correct. Okay. I did have to feed them snacks, uh, but it's true. it's okay. That that I can handle. Yeah, that would be rude otherwise. Right, but I I feel like it was a really. It was a good thing um, to the point where this summer I'm planning on doing not only one week, but hopefully a few more and maybe for other ages. So um, so it's called Camp Blue Star. And so just kind of keep an eye out for I'll eventually be plugging that once I'm done with the mural. But um, <laughs> look for that in the future, too. And then I realize I have to ask the obvious question. So how did you come up with the name Emily Blue Star? So stars are just, I don't know, for some reason have always been really important to me. And just like the first tattoo I wanted to get was going to be a star. And it's like back when I was in high school, like it's, I've always just kind of had an affinity for the shape of a star. And then blue is my favorite color, turquoise specifically. My technical business name, my LLC, is Blue Star Inc., as an I-N-K, not incorporated. Um, so, yeah, back in the day, that was my business name. So now I've just adopted Emily Blue Star for short. And stars have since played an even more important role as my life went on because um, the reason I met my husband was because of a star. He had two star tattoos and I I had never actually gotten that star I first mentioned, but I saw his star tattoos and I asked him like, what's the significance of your star tattoos? And we got started talking and that was like the first conversation we ever had. And then long story short, we eventually got married and then the star was kind of our logo for our wedding. And then when we ended up having a baby, a baby girl, we named her Stella, which means star. And so, so stars have always just kind of played an important role in my relationships and in my life. So yeah, that might be kind of lame, but I love it. You really commit to a theme. I like it. Yes. You can check out more of Emily's stuff at emilyballsley.com. And also I would suggest that you follow her on Instagram at emilybluestar. This is actually the last episode for this season. So if you'd like to know more about what's going on, I would suggest that you sign up for the email list at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. And I'll keep you up to date on stuff that I'm doing until the next season comes. And if you're on the email list, that's where I'll be doing a call out for artists to talk to me on the next season of the podcast. The music for this episode is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. And also, I've been doing a music-based show talking to other musicians and people like that on that website at lorenzosmusic.com. So don't forget to sign up for the email list, and I'll be back in a few weeks with another season. Until then, so long. (laughs) ¶¶